Tasya Gananjana Shalakaya Chakshurun Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Om Hari Om Jaya Sriman Narayana Very good. So with that, I just wanted to give a somewhat brief talk today, um, talking about the fact that we have just entered a new year. You know, today I believe is the 8th, so just a few <laughs> days ago we had, uh, we had our New Year celebration, and we left 2011 behind, and it is now 2012, that infamous year. <laughs> so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, what we are to expect, but more how to approach the coming year in a very spiritual sort of way. But before I do that, first let me just talk in general about the significance of New Year's resolutions. Because we know in the West especially this is a very, very uh, important idea that people tend to take resolutions when there's a new year. You know, a resolution that, oh, I'm going to lose weight, I'm going to stop smoking, I'm going to be a nicer person, you know, I'm going to, you know, take my uh, dog out for more, wa more walks than I usually have been. <laughs> you know, we make a, a resolution. Um, interestingly, of course, spiritually speaking, to make a resolution is a very serious thing. Uh, so much so that within Sanatana Dharma, we have a Sanskrit word for this, vratta, vratta, what's called a vratta, um, a vow. You know, rather than resolution, we call it a vow. And the idea is this, that if we are indeed going to resolve to do something, to improve ourselves, to make ourselves better, two things to keep in mind. Number one, better to have it be a spiritual resolution as opposed to just something like, oh, I'm going to give up smoking or something like that, which is good too. But this is the thing. If we make a spiritual resolution very specifically, the more spiritual we become, the more calm we become, the happier we become. As a result of this, all the other resolutions will take care of themselves. You see, once we begin the spiritual path, in time, trust me, you're going to stop smoking. <laughs> trust me, you're going to treat people nicer around you. Trust me, all of these peripheral issues that we think about, that we worry about, just kind of take care of themselves. You know, that is the truly amazing thing about taking a resolution to improve ourselves spiritually, as opposed to just focusing on individual little items that we want to improve in our lives. When we focus on improving ourselves spiritually, what are we doing? We're going directly to the root. We're going to the very core, the very center of who and what we are. And what we very soon discover is all of these other things, whether it's bad habits, whether it's uh, what are called anartas, or little habits, things that we have in our psyche that we don't like, things that we know we should improve. When we go to the center, these things melt away. They just melt away automatically. You know, uh, my guru and Prabhupada, many gurus actually, used to give this example. They would say that, oh, we all have little problems that will require, maybe one dollar will solve that, ten dollars will solve that problem. But if you win a million dollars, all your one dollar problems are solved. <laughs> well, spiritually speaking, this is true as well. Once we have spiritual realization, the small problems are solved. So we don't have to go around and around, you know, worrying about the little fires. Let the flood come and all the fires will be put out. So this is the idea very specifically of a spiritual resolution, what is called a vratta. And what I would call upon people to do, especially now, especially with the fact that this infamous year of 2012 has now started, <laughs> I would ask people to take spiritual vows. And what this means is indeed to improve ourselves spiritually in every way. It means incrementally, little by little, increasing what we are doing spiritually. Yes, quantitatively. Quantity is of importance too. But of course, especially qualitatively. With everything that we're doing, when we are cultivating devotion, for example, try to cultivate more devotion. You know, As we are deep within meditation and focusing on the name of God, try to focus even more. 
as we are attempting to trust in the divine, and for many of us, for many human beings, this is a big issue, just trusting God. <laughs> you know, how many people are there who something bad happens and we want to blame God? That trust has to be there. We need to trust the divine. Well, let us increase that trust more and more and more. Now, let me talk very specifically about this important year, 2012. And people may remember, it's up on YouTube now, that I did a talk about three years ago, I think March or so of 2009, where I talked for over an hour about the significance of not just 2012, but what the future holds. And I talked about uh, many, many different topics, both negative and, and very positive, very spiritual. And as we know, we now are here at this time. So are there riots outside if we look out the window? Has planet Nibiru, dis Nibiru descended upon us? Are we in a life raft right No. <laughs> what is my point? My point is that, of course, it's not that, oh, the moment the 2012 hits, suddenly the world is going to end. That's what a lot of people thought. And of course, they were wrong on two counts. Number one, uh, there is no automatic transition in ages like that. It's not that, you know, one moment it's one year, then the next moment it's the next year, and zoom, everything changes. No, rather, transitions take place very slowly, slowly, as in nature. In nature, transitions take place slowly. That's the first thing. Second misconception that people had was that 2012 would lead to destruction, the end of the world. No. no. And I made this very clear in the previous video, that talk that I gave three years ago as well. No. We're not going to have the end of the world. What we are going to have is a time of transition. And what a time of transition means is indeed both good and bad. It means that we're going to have many, many challenges as a society, as a nation, as a world. It means that we're going to see many bad things happen. And let me ask people here, three years after I gave that talk, have we seen some pretty bad things happen in the last three years? Yeah, we have. Hmm? Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, we've seen floods, we've seen tornadoes, we've seen the economy go zoom <laughs> downhill. We've seen politically many bad things happen. People do not trust politicians anymore in any way, shape, or form, and neither should they. You know, we've seen that uh, politically things are not good. We see that the, uh, even the elections that, uh, interestingly, also are happening in November of 2012. Uh, the elections are completely open. Anything can happen. Literally anything can happen. You know, we've never had such uh, a question mark over who's going to be the next president of the United States as we do this year, in my memory at least, and I'm 48 and I've observed most of the elections <laughs> in most of those years. So we've seen many bad things happen. Have we also seen good things happen? You know, especially individually, for many of the individuals in this room. You know, could you not say that in the last several years, possibly, You've increased your understanding of spirituality, that as a result of meditation, as a result of yoga, that your realizations possibly have become deeper, you know, that your meditation itself has improved, that you found that it's easier to go into meditation. Have you not found that spiritually speaking, you have possibly improved in the last few years? Yes, I would hope. So what have we seen, both good and bad, both good and bad? And we are going to continue to see this. I personally believe that um, late 2012, early 2013, actually, is indeed going to be a time of transition. Having said this, again, nobody, and let me repeat this, nobody today knows exactly what is going to happen. And that very much includes myself, and I make that clear to people. Anyone who does claim, oh yes, I know exactly what's going to happen, they start to give you exact dates and exact instances, they're lying. And they probably are lying to make a dollar. You know, we find many people like this, everyone knows exactly what's going to happen, exactly when, because an angel told them, or because they had a psychic vision, or a crystal started whispering into their ear, or <laughs> something. Uh, no, they do not know exactly what's going to happen. What we do know are uh, the general trends. What we do know is what the scriptures have told us 
And that's something that we can indeed have faith in, not blind faith, but faith because we've seen the scriptures have been very accurate. And the scriptures of, interestingly, not just Sanatana Dharma, but also Tibetan Buddhism, the Kala Chakra Tantra specifically in Tibetan Buddhism, and many other scriptures talk about this era. And indeed, what are we going to see? What, what can we expect to see? Generally speaking, we can expect things to get much worse. That's not a surprise to a lot of people. <laughs> we can expect things to get much worse. But again, this is what's wonderful. As externally, materially, things are getting worse, spiritually we're also going to see things get better for ourselves as individuals, but also we're going to begin to see an awakening in the masses such that we have never seen in our lives. It's going to be a spiritual awakening that we are going to begin seeing. In fact, we're seeing it now. We're seeing it now. We're seeing many people who are beginning to question everything around them, which is a good thing. You know, Sanatana Dharma tells us to question everything, prashna, question everything around us. We have to question what is our reality. We have to question our politicians. We have to question our society. We have to question ourselves. We have to question what is this all about? And is everything that has been presented to me by my culture, by the media, by politicians, by everything that I find around me, is it real? Is it actually the truth? Or is it an artificial construct? You see, again, especially for those of us who are old enough to remember when people were a lot more trusting <laughs> in the 70s, you know, even into the 80s, nobody questioned anything. Whatever was told to them by a news anchor, by a journalist, they just accepted as true. Not anymore. Now we know that journalists are just as dishonest as criminals. We know this. No one trusts journalists anymore. Now we question everything. Of course, it's not good to question for, simply for the sake of questioning, just to be a skeptic. Rather, we have to question intelligently. Okay, I'm being presented with uh, several propositions which this powerful individual is insisting is true. Well, I need to question this. Is this actually the case? So what do we see around us? We see individuals throughout the world who now are questioning, questioning their reality. And that is a wonderful thing. Absolutely a wonderful thing. So, as we get closer and closer to that dreaded date, December 21st, <laughs> 20, 2012, and really, again, in accordance with my Vedic understanding, uh, even more so, the period from December 2012 until approximately February, March of 2013 is really the important transition point. You see, we don't just go by the Mayans, we also go by the Vedas as well, by the Puranas and other scriptures as well. Um, what are we to do in order to prepare ourselves for the worst and for the best? Well, I want to talk about that a little bit, just a little bit. You know, again, just in a very brief, very general sort of way. There are several things that, as individuals, we can do in order to make sure that this transition that is about to take place is something that is positive for us and everyone around us. First, what I mentioned before. Number one, try to increase the spiritual quality of our life in every way. What that means is look at yourself, see what you're doing now, and try to increase it. Try to increase it, just incrementally. See, the thing about spirituality and what makes spirituality different from, let's say, denomina denominational religion is that we don't believe in doing things fanatically, but incrementally. It's not that, okay, oh, well, now that, you know, now that uh, we're in 2012, now that we don't know what's going to happen, you know, we should all become fanatical yogis and we should just renounce everything and just be in meditation for 12 hours a day. No, no, that, that's silly. 
Uh, if you take a vow to start meditating for 12 hours a day, I can guarantee you that after the third day you'll break your vow, <laughs> most likely, for many reasons. No, we're not meant to do things fanatically, but rather incrementally. Let's look at what we are doing now and increase it. You know, That's the first thing. Second thing is this, and this is very important. I mentioned how increasingly when we look at the world around us, what do we see? We see that people are starting to wake up, that people are starting to question their existence, that people are indeed starting to turn to spiritual practices, to spiritual worldviews in order to make sense of the world around them. Let's help them to do that. So this is number two. Let us help not only ourselves by increasing our own sadhana, our own spiritual practice, but also let's reach out to others. Again, as I always say, what do I say? Not preaching, but teaching. You see, again, not like these fanatics who are holding up signs, oh, the world's going to end May 21st, you know, 2011. No, no, that's fanaticism. That's preaching. We don't believe in preaching. But very calmly, very lovingly, with great compassion, whenever we see that there are individuals who we meet and we see that they are questioning, let us help them with their questions in whatever capacity we can. Let us help them to become more spiritual people. Let us introduce to them the teachings of the Bhagavad Gita. Let us introduce to them meditation, mantra meditation. Om Namo Narayanaya, meditating upon the divine names of God. You know? And in this way, let us uh, increase this mass awakening. Let us help this mass awakening that is taking place. Okay? Third, with whatever happens, good or bad, and again, I don't know exactly what's going to happen. No one does. But with whatever does happen, let us always know that the universe is our friend. Let us always know that behind all occurrences is the divine, is God. If we even see a tornado coming our way, <laughs> let's run. <laughs> but let us also understand that nature itself is an expression of dharma. And sometimes it has uh, an angry face, sometimes it has a smiling face, but beneath the face, beyond the face, there is God, always. You know? So this is very important. How we make our own transition through this transition of ages really depends upon us, upon our attitude. If we approach everything with fear, with confusion, you know, with wonderment, with astonishment, oh my God, what's happening? Oh, the, the economy of this nation in Europe just collapsed. There are riots happening over here. If we approach such news with fear, you know, what we end up doing, unfortunately, is just extending that fear into the world. And rather than helping people, making the situation worse. Imagine if when things, if things go badly, we ourselves are an island of calm. And those around us see that. They too will become islands of calm. So let us con contribute to making the world better in this way through this transition with our own attitude. Next thing I want to talk about is fear. Fear itself. You know, it's interesting. When, again, transitions take place, and they can be large transitions, they can be small transitions. If you look at history, all of history, history is nothing but the history of transitions. From one empire to another, from one era to another, you know, from the Middle Ages to the Renaissance, to the Industrial Age, you know, to the age of ideology of the 20th century to now the, the technological age, the information age. We see that there's transition after transition after transition after transition. These transitions, or any transitions, in fact, in life can cause fear. But, of course, as I like to repeat to everyone again and again, what does Krishna say in Bhagavad Gita? Ma shuchaha, do not fear. Do not fear. We have to understand always that ultimately, regardless of what is happening around us, whether seemingly it is paradise or seemingly hell, and sometimes both simultaneously. You know, like I was saying, sometimes things are great, but also bad in different ways. 
regardless of what we see around us, we must always understand spiritually there is no basis for fear. There is never a basis for fear. Why is this the case? Because ultimately, all that really maximally can be harmed is our body. We don't want our body to be harmed, <laughs> certainly, you know, we're intelligent about this. But I'm just saying, maximally, that is the most that can be harmed, the most. And we are not our body. We are eternal Atman. We are eternal spirit. We have been through many, many bodies before. Hopefully this is our last, but if not, we'll have more bodies in the future. But the truth of the matter is, Krishna assures us in the second chapter of Bhagavad Gita again and again and again. The body can be burnt, the body can be made wet, the body can be cut, but the soul never, the soul never can be affected by any of these things. Krishna says to Arjuna, never was there a time when I did not exist, nor you, nor all of these kings upon this battlefield. Neither shall we ever cease to be. If we understand this principle, and more, not just understand it here, if we live as Atman, as, as spirit, when we live as these eternal beings, fear ceases. Because we know that whatever happens around us, A, I am eternal, B, that eternal aspect of myself is Atman, and C, that Atman is very lovingly caressed in the palms of God. So, nothing to fear in any way whatsoever. So, transitions. When transitions take place, again, they don't take place in the spur of a moment, but rather it takes a very long time. So, when finally December of 2012 comes, and then January of 2013, February of 2013, and we haven't seen that the world has turned upside down and everything has changed in the blink of an eye, are we then going to say, oh, well, I guess this was all nonsense then? Of course not. Because no one, at least no one intelligent, no one who <laughs> truly has any spiritual insight, would have claimed that that would have happened to begin with. In fact, on the contrary, I would not be surprised personally if December 21st, 2012 comes, and it's a very quiet day. This is the important part, the important thing to keep in mind, is that despite what happens on that day, that month, the month after, the month after that, it is a time of transition. This is something that I personally very much believe, having done the research, and again, especially in the Sanskritic literature, more so than the Mayans. It will be a time of transition. We will indeed be entering a golden age that will last for 10,000 years, because Krishna says this, in the Puranas, Brahma Vagarta Purana specifically, but it's not necessarily going to be dramatic. You see, the way that an age changes is like nature, slowly. Can you really tell when one age ends and another one begins? Not necessarily. In fact, in the scriptures itself, it's interesting. When it talks about the yugas, these, these grand ages that take place, when it talks about the transition between them, it says several things. First, it says that, yes, there will be tremendous destruction and very specifically pralaya, floods. And we have indeed been seeing for the last four or five years um, increasing floods throughout the world. You know, I've pointed this out to, to many people. You just have to be aware of the news. And practically every week it will say, oh, you know, such and such place has been flooded and it's the greatest flood that that place has had in history. That happened in France, that happened in, in Brazil, that happened in, uh, in Thailand. Yes, in Thailand, they're still experiencing flood. It happened, I believe, was in Rhode Island uh, just last year. I think Rhode Island was flooded or the, the Northeast. And again, it's not just that, that we c continually have these floods, but when you read the objective news reports themselves, they'll always have that same line. And not only was it flooded, it was the greatest flood that they've had in the history of that state, in the history of that nation. It's amazing. So what we are seeing is pralaya right now. We're seeing an increase in flood. We had floods here in Omaha, 
You know, we were worried about the nuclear reactor. We didn't know what was going to happen. You know, thankfully the waters began receding. But we're going to have next summer. <laughs> Summer's going to come again. So this is one thing that we see. But the other thing that the scriptures talk about very specifically, and it gives this example, it explains that when we have a transition of ages, the other thing that we see is this, and it gives this exact example. When you go to the beach, and you go to the shoreline, and you're standing on the sand, can you objectively, seriously, scientifically point to exactly where the dry beach ends and where the ocean begins? You can't. Because the waves are constantly coming in, going out, coming in, going out. You know when you're in the ocean <laughs> because you're wet. You know when you're on dry land because you're not wet. But can you point, this is exactly right here where the ocean begins and where the beach ends? You can't. You can't. The transition in ages is exactly the same way. So as a result, even though the Golden Age officially has not begun, we're beginning to see the effects of the Golden Age and more when the Golden Age begins. Does that mean that, again, <laughs> you know, at an exact time, you know, 12, 12 a.m. midnight on this date, okay, oh, isn't that interesting? Okay, now that it's one minute past that, all disease has ended, all suffering has ended. No, of course not. There's still going to be suffering. There's still going to be, you know, some remnants, remnants of the previous age. So, again, we need to know precisely what we are looking for. Not something dramatic, but instead, general trends. So, the greatest way that we can ourselves, individually, but then also as a society, prepare for this transition in ages that we're about to experience, is to prepare ourselves spiritually. To be as happy and positive as possible. Experience joy. You know, we've seen that with the Kali Yuga, that increasingly, exponentially, joy has ceased. Joy is just a word today. There was a time, and again, I'm prejudiced for the, uh, about the 70s. I grew up in the 70s. <laughs> I remember a time when people just naturally expressed joy. It was fun to just hang out. It was fun to just experience life. There wasn't all this anxiety. People just had a joy that was so natural to them that it didn't register. It was kind of like a fish, a fish being in the ocean, not aware of the ocean around it, not aware of the water. Well, there was a time when people were jo so joyful that the environment around them was so joyful, they didn't even notice it, they simply were joyful. That's gone. That's gone. Now everything is anxiety. Everything is anxiety. Everything is conflict. Everything is manipulation. Everything is games. Everything is, oh, what does this person want from me? What's happening? You know, that joy is gone. This is what I would ask people to do. Forget about whether the joy is gone, generally speaking, in society. Be joyful yourself as individuals. And in this way, the joy will come back. Seek beauty. Seek happiness. Seek, indeed, joy in everything you do in everything that you see. When you have time, and I know everybody is busy today. Everybody's busy today. I get it. I understand. But when you have time, get out into nature. You know, even if it just means going to some beautiful park where, it, where there's some nature, where there are some trees, where there's some greenery, where you can hear birds chirping, where you don't have to hear cars going by constantly. Get out into nature. And just breathe in and feel joyful, feel happy, you know? Lose this fear. And again, grow spiritually in such a way that when this transition finally takes place, regardless of what happens, bad, good, a mixture of both, regardless of what happens, you don't have fear. Fear is the greatest torture. It's the greatest suffering. But live your life in such a way that you don't have that fear, you don't have that suffering. And live your life in such a way that with everything, all the processes happening around you, the natural processes of this transition in ages, within you are open to the love of God. And more than that, you become like a mirror such that you reflect that love that God gives you then onto all beings around you. 
And in this way, we will be individually prepared for whatever happens, good and bad, but more because of our example and because of our releasing that love into the universe, we will ensure that that transition will indeed ultimately be good for everyone. So, with that, thank you very much. Namaskar.